It's had bikes, cars, unicycles, horses, horse carriages, and millions of people ascend its spiral ramp over 400 odd years. It once acted as a lighthouse and a bomb shelter during World War II. Hans Christian Andersen was a frequent visitor. What am I talking about? Copenhagen's Round Tower, of course. Hey guys, welcome back to Erin in Copenhagen. Today I'm going to take you up the famous round tower in the middle of the city, and you know me, I'm going to point out all the little known history trivia that you can look out for along the way. But before we head in there, I just want to say a really quick thank you to everybody who's watched and subscribed so far. From the very beginning, when I created this channel, I wanted to create my own little Copenhagen community in my corner of YouTube, and you guys have been absolutely amazing. I really consider this channel a two-way thing, so if you have any comments, ideas, suggestions, or you just want to say hi, don't be a stranger down in the comments. Which reminds me, one last thing, I've had a couple people ask me to do a Q&A if this is something you're interested in, if you have a question you've always wanted me to answer, again, just pop it down in the comments. Uh, I'm going to do a little video on that soon for you guys. All right, enough talking. Let's head over to the tower. There's just so much to unpack in this small but iconic Copenhagen landmark. So let's start with the outside. Something that's easy to miss but is a very intentional design feature is if you look super close up to the building, you'll notice that the brick color actually alternates between red and yellow. These were the official royal colors at the time for the House of Oldenburg. The round tower was commissioned by King Christian IV, who, if you know anything about Danish history, you'll know that he was a hugely influential part of Copenhagen's history, and many of the oldest buildings you'll still see in Copenhagen today are thanks to him. So another thing that's easy to overlook on the outside is this big ass sign on the side of the tower. Like if you really look at it, you start to think, wait, what does that even mean? This is another one of Christian IV's little personal touches on the round tower. It's a rebus, which is a type of puzzle that combines the use of images with letters to depict words or a phrase. In this case, it combines words in Latin and Hebrew and uses images of a heart, a crown, and a sword. The giant C in the middle of the building's founding date refers to Christian IV. This little C symbol was like his thing. You'll find it in many parts of Copenhagen. Essentially what the puzzle is saying is something like, guide the doctrine, justice, and God in the crowned heart of King Christian IV. Of course, there's been lots of debate over the exact translation, and there are a few variations on the wording, but it's basically just an old king using a fancy, convoluted way to proclaim his awesomeness and dedication to God. Okay, let's head inside now. We'll go buy a ticket and we'll start climbing to the top. So construction started on the tower in 1637 and was finished in 1642. From the very beginning, the building was to be used as an observatory, and the observation deck above us is located 34.8 meters above street level. The tower, you may have noticed, is actually attached to a church at the back. This was designed as kind of a three-pronged purpose. The church was initially for the local university students, and there was also a university library on the first floor above the church, which was accessible only via the round tower. And the third and final bit of the design was, of course, the round tower itself, which was to be used as the observatory. Many have speculated why a spiral ramp was used in the design rather than more traditional stairs. While the original designers don't outright explain why, it's likely that it was simply to make it easier to transport heavy instruments up to the observatory, as well as all the heavy books to and from the library via horse and carriage. Which brings me to all the crazy things I mentioned in the intro that have come up this ramp. Perhaps the most famous of all was Russian Tsar Peter the Great in 1716, who ascended the ramp on horseback during a visit to Copenhagen. His wife Catherine I reportedly ascended behind him in a horse-drawn carriage. Then in 1902, a Beaufort car drove up the ramp because why not, I guess? There's also been bike races, and still to this day, once a year in spring, if you have a unicycle and feel like doing something a little crazy in Copenhagen, you can even unicycle your way up and down the round tower. All it costs is the price of admission. So I guess there's another little idea of something different to do in Copenhagen for you. 
So we're just coming up to the library, or what used to be the library, but now it's just used as an exhibition space. A frequent visitor of the old university library was Danish fairy tale author Hans Christian Andersen. And as a result, several of his works either reference the Round Tower or were set here, like To Be or Not To Be, The Tinderbox, and The Elder Tree Mother. He also referenced the tower in one of his early poems called The Horrible Hour. It pictured Hans waking up with a start in the university library at midnight, and to his horror, he finds that the Round Tower is gone, aka his only way down from the library. Instead, what is left when he opens the library door is just a dark abyss down to the street. That would definitely be pretty scary to wake up to. Another thing to look out for as you walk up the tower are the window panes. In the past, visitors used to scratch their names into them. Here are a couple I found. It should go without saying, but obviously, if you come to the Round Tower, please don't do this yourself. It's more of a historical feature that you can enjoy rather than contribute to. Try and see the oldest date you can find. I think 1900 was the oldest one I saw. So this little doorway here is actually one of the astronomer's old toilets. There used to be two in the tower. It was built on a system where the waste essentially just fell down a shaft into what is now considered one of the world's first septic tank systems. Unfortunately, the design left no way for this chamber to actually be emptied, so the waste just piled up for hundreds of years until it was eventually cleared away and the toilet was disused. Just imagine how that must have smelled. One interesting thing about this toilet that you can look out for are all these black marks on the lime walls here. These are actually old nicotine stains. It used to be popular to sit and smoke while on the toilet, which I presume also helped mask the horrible stench coming from down below. The second toilet is found much further up near the top, where today this kissing bench is found. Yeah, sorry to ruin the romance, but this little perch used to look and smell quite different back in the day. Great view of the city from here, though. Oh, here you can see the inner hollow core of the round tower. No one actually knows why they left the center hollow, maybe for some kind of experiment, but today you can go look down via a little glass viewing platform, if you're brave enough. Someone actually fell down the inner shaft once. In June 1880, a 12-year-old choir boy called August Nielsen was playing hide-and-seek with a friend while the pastor was preaching in the church down below. If you look up over your head, you can see the hole that August fell out of down into the shaft below. He was found almost a day later, luckily just with a few scrapes, but because there was no like architectural access to this inner core, they had to cut a hole in the bottom of the round tower to get him out. As you near the top, you might notice this beautiful gilded square thing up on the wall. This is actually the tower's planetarium, which shows the planetary positions as they are right now. It was originally constructed at the time the tower was built, but it was severely damaged in the Great City Fire of 1728, so it's been restored a few times. In 1822, it was finally placed vertically up here, and still to this day, someone needs to wind it up once a week to keep the clockwork mechanism going. All right, now we're finally getting to the top. Let's go check out the view. As you walk around up here, you might wonder what all the wonderful spires and buildings you're looking at are. Luckily, they've put signs up all around so you know what everything is. On clear days, both the Öresund Bridge and Sweden can be seen from here. The beautiful outer fence you can see here is actually the original from 1643. 
So now for maybe my favorite bit of Guanatuan trivia. For two months in 1750, the tower actually acted as a lighthouse. The story behind it was, there was a new lighthouse being built in a place called Skane. They had designed this new, innovative type of lantern to use on top of the lighthouse, but they didn't want to drag the heavy pieces hundreds of kilometers away, only for the project to be a failure. So they trialed their lighting prototype atop the round tower, right in the middle of Copenhagen. So there you have it. There was your own personal tour around the round tower. Hopefully, even if you've been here before, you discovered something new. Either way, thanks so much for coming along. Make sure you subscribe, leave any questions you have for my Q&A down below, and I'll see you on the next Copenhagen adventure.